watching The Sports Objective, the podcast for Pirates. You're listening to A Pirate's Life for Me on The Sports Objective. Join us every Friday at noon as we catch up with a member of Pirate Nation. Here's your host, Bubba Rosenbaum. What is going on, Pirate Nation? Welcome into another edition of A Pirate's Life for me here on the Sports Objective Podcast channel. Uh, today, we're catching up with someone I've known since my childhood. Uh, he's seen more than 40 years of East Carolina football now. And welcome into the show, John McMillan. John, we appreciate your time this evening. How you doing today, Bubba? I'm doing great. It's great to catch up with you. Uh, like we were discussing off the air, um, I think I've known you since I was probably about 11 or 12 years old uh, there early on in the Steve Logan era. But, um, you know, so many memories, so many stories to tell over these next uh, 45 minutes or so. And uh, I'm sure this will uh, certainly just be, a, you know, tip of the iceberg type of conversation because um, I know you're just like myself. And um, once you start talking pirate football, time flies and uh, we'll definitely have you back on down the road. But, um, you know, before we talk about your time at East Carolina, just tell us, I know you're from that Piedmont triad region of our state um, here in North Carolina, and you were raised in the city of Greensboro, and then you went on to play high school ball at Greensboro Page. Uh, but tell us about your childhood, you know, in addition to football, what other sports did you play? And uh, and then we'll dive into your recruitment. Oh, okay, well, always – always willing and anxious to talk about pirate football. I, uh, I, I was born in California. My dad was actually in the Air Force. He wasn't a lifer, but of all places, I was born in Victorville, California. We were only there a short while. But uh, I, I was raised and spent most of my life in Greensboro. <clears throat> and I did go to Greensboro Page, uh, played football, and I wrestled. Uh, I was a better football player than a wrestler, but I'm proud to say that our wrestling team at Greensboro Page in uh, 68, 69, and 70 never lost a dual wrestling match. And we were uh, sectional or regional champs for all three years and state champs. This is 4A, my junior and senior year. So uh, we had an outstanding wrestling program at Greensboro Page. Our football team was pretty good. Uh, six and six, seven, three, and eight and two, the years that I played. Um, I uh, was recruited by Sonny Randall out of East Carolina and Red Parker out of the Citadel. Um, short story there, my dad was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. Of course, that's where the Citadel is. My mother was born and raised in Camden, South Carolina. So they were very familiar with the Citadel. Um, the only other uh, interest I got in football was from App State, but I was not offered a, a scholarship there. But uh, I was an okay football player. I, I went both ways, offensive and defensive line. And uh, I was not outstanding, but I was, I was decent enough to be offered a scholarship. But um, the reason I wanted to talk about this just a little bit, I, I had a uh, an interesting recruitment uh, period. Now you got to remember this was in the fall of 1970 and January of 71. So there was no social media. I mean, recruiting was just telephone calls and, and personal visits. So uh, uh, I went down, uh, Sonny Randall asked me to come down with another offensive lineman and visit East Carolina. And we did. And uh, I had a really, really good time. I, I, my host was Greg Troop, who was an offensive lineman at the time. And uh, we walked from Belt Dorm down to Green Dorm. He had a date and I was kind of a third wheel. We ended up at the elbow room and uh, I sat down with Dan Killebrew and Jimbo Walker, Wilbur Williamson and a few others. Uh, and uh, we, we had a pretty good time there that night. It was a Friday night, and we ended up across the river at DW's Grill. Now, anybody close to my age, I just turned 70, has heard all kinds of stories about DW's Grill at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. But um, I uh, 
remember uh, vividly that recruiting trip. I, I did commit the next day uh, to East Carolina. And this was either the middle of December or the 1st of January. Now, the signing date was still the, uh, the first Wednesday of, of February. But I really never heard back from East Carolina. So switch gears to Charleston. I flew down to uh, the Citadel. And I'll never forget flying on Piedmont Airlines on a Friday morning out of Greensboro. It was the first time I ever took a, a, a flight on an air, airplane. I was the only person on that jet airliner. It was a big plane. I was the only passenger. And that was that was crazy. But uh, at the Citadel, they wanted me to commit. And I didn't tell them I had committed to East Carolina. But uh, I went through the whole process down there. Now, this was during the Vietnam War. And of course, this is a military school. And I wasn't really crazy about it. Um, but when I got back, my parents, they were kind of excited about the possibility of me being down there. But I, I told them I didn't think I was going to go. Well, long story short, Don Murray was the receivers coach down there. He called me every Wednesday night and every Sunday afternoon for weeks. And keep in mind, I had committed to ECU, but I never heard back from them. When it came time to sign, on Tuesday night, my dad came into my bedroom. He said, have you made up your mind? I said, I, I really haven't. He said, well, I'll just tell you this. If you decide to go to the Citadel and if you stay and work in the state of South Carolina, uh, you'll never have to worry about having a job because that diploma means something down there. Well, sure enough, Sonny Randall called me uh, that next day and they had, they had mailed the scholarship offers. There's no fax machines or anything then. And I, I told him, I said, I decided to play at the Citadel. And he was a little upset, but he didn't hang around long. He went on to the, the you know, another guy. And when the Citadel called, I told him I decided to play down there and they seemed a little surprised. But the reason I, I tell that story I didn't know how to tell the Citadel coaches no. And that's a heck of a way to make a college decision. But uh, they had just showed so much interest in me and uh, had, had really made me feel welcome and wanted. Um, I didn't know at, at 17 years old, I didn't know how to tell those guys no. So that was a weakness on my part. And I've learned from that. But I did go down there. I didn't like it. I did stick it out through five freshman games. Um, I wanted to leave the first week I was there. My dad said, just stick it out through football season. And uh, I did. But uh, I left and uh, started at East Carolina in January, which was winter, the beginning of winter quarter. But that was my recruiting story. And, of course, I went hat in hand to Coach Randall's office and asked if I could walk on. And he said, yes, but as you know, Southern Conference rules, you got to sit out a year, but you'll need to go through winter, spring, summer, fall, and again, and go through all the drills. I said, I'm aware of that. Well, I did go through spring, uh, winter conditioning and spring. And uh, I, I found out about club football. And uh, I fell in love with club football and I was not committed enough to stay on the varsity. So that was the end of my varsity practicing at uh, East Carolina. And I went to work at the elbow room and that was all she wrote for my varsity football career. <laughs> but I, I decided I enjoyed the elbow room and, and uh, everything that goes with that more than I enjoyed the commitment and dedication needed to play varsity football. <laughs> but uh, I mentioned the elbow room because I, I managed that place for four or five years. I worked for Danny Bersini and Joey McGordy. And the reason I bring Danny into this conversation, he was uh, a, a key role, key key person in, in he and I going to all of these road games through the Steve Logan years. Right. And um, that, that was when I came to know you when you were, if the Pirates were playing, uh, John McMillan was there. And I, one of the things that was you know, awesome about that time uh, is that you had a chance to make 
the majority, if not all of those trips uh, with your father, correct? Dad, Dad and I went to uh, a lot of those games together. I, ch I cherish those, those memories and those times we had together. Um, I joined the I graduated in, in 76 and I joined the pirate club in 82. Um, and, and Danny Bersini and I went to a lot of ball games, home games together. And we would go to Raleigh and we'd go to Chapel Hill, you know, during the seventies and eighties. And, uh, so we just love pirate football. Um, and, and of course, when, uh, when, when we had the Peach Bowl year, you know, everybody's interest level, you know, was, was, was raised a, a notch or two. Uh, and I had purchased season tickets, I think the year before, but, um, we, Danny and I started going to, um, every game in, uh, 93. Now during the 92 season, um, Joyce Stroud, who was the administrative assistant in the football office. She had come with Bill Lewis or Bill Lewis had hired her. Joyce worked uh, in that office for 18 years, but she knew Danny and uh, Danny had, had moved to Myrtle beach by the early nineties. He worked as VP of sales for Pepper Tree resorts. And she asked Danny if, if he could maybe sponsor a, a couple of vacations uh, for some assistant coaches to help out. And, and he gladly did. And, uh, it was more than just a couple of assistant coaches. You know, he gave, he gave about the entire coaching staff some vacations there at Pepper Tree. Well, coach Logan found out about this and, 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 you know, out of a lot of gratitude, he said, Hey, Danny, you know, you're doing a lot for us here. What can I do in return? And Danny said, well, you know, I, uh, John and I go to a lot of games and, you know, what I'd like to do is just maybe hear you give a half, a, a pregame speech, you know, in, in the locker room, maybe have a sideline pass or something. He said, Oh, that's easy. We'll, we'll do that anytime you want. And, uh, Danny and I said, you know, an SEC stadium would be a, a fun thing to, to be on the sidelines for. So we, we decided we would do that for the Kentucky game in 1993. Um, and we did, and it rained and rained and rained, and the final score was six to three. We got beat by Kentucky six to three. I'll never forget that. But remember it well. Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> had our opportunities. Yep, it was the first time that we had actually had the chance to go in. I mean, full access. You know, go in with the team before the game and 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 just go through the whole the whole deal. Well, uh, we had actually gone to Washington earlier that year um unfortunately you know mark crandall had broke his leg the week before so we didn't have a, a chance but uh it was a beautiful sunny day uh unlike seattle which is usually wet and, and dreary but th that's a, a nice stadium when you can sit in one end zone and see all the way to the other end zone and that's lake washington out there with all the boats docked and mount, mount rainier and the in the background and you got pipes market and the space needle. That's a, a nice trip to go to. So we enjoyed that Seattle trip, but that's how Danny and I just started going to every single game. And you're right. Uh, I did start taking dad on, on some of those trips as well. Mom and dad went with Vicki and I uh, to all the home games. So it was truly, you talk about a pirate's life for me. We, we all were, were diehard pirates for many, many years. And I remember seeing your dad, Gary, and you at some of the walkthroughs. Um, and it was just a, it was just a, a way of life for us during football season. I mean, we planned weekends around football. I mean, that's just the way it was for for the 12 years that that Steve was our head coach. Um, you know, Carl Davis, you know, who much of the same boat I mean, traveling to there's so many road games um, for for years and years, and I'm n not uh, able to do that anymore. But I'm still, you know, just such a diehard pirate and uh, loyal supporter of the program. And um, the author of the book, My View from Twenty Rows Up, and uh, it, haven't had the opportunity to purchase that book. I really look forward to doing so. And um, 
so if somebody is interested, um, very quickly, uh, told him I would um, get this plug in. Um, if you're interested in purchasing the book and having him sign it, personalize it, there will be book signings. Um, Free Boot Friday on Friday, September the 8th from 5 to 9 in downtown Greenville prior to the Marshall game. Um, the day of the games, Saturday, September 9th from 11 to 1 at the UBE there on Cotent Street, um, which most Pirate fans certainly know where that is. And then um, on September 23rd, um, he will be at Stadium Sports on the corner of 14th and Charles, the old Harris Teeter shopping center there by the, the train trestle on the, that bridge. Um, and he'll, he'll be there from one to three on the 23rd. So definitely uh, check out that book. I, bl I believe, uh, I believe you've, you were certainly familiar with it. If, if you've not already purchased a copy, correct? Oh, I've, yeah, I've read the book. Uh, it's, it's an outstanding, um, memorabilia of of pirate football he did a great job and and, and I, since i've been to to those venues I, I i knew exactly what he was referring to now i didn't take in the sights and sounds uh, uh that that he and his wife did you know i was there for football pretty much but uh i knew exactly where where he was coming from i could relate to so much that he wrote about he did a fantastic job i i uh i sat in the same seats for 30 years five rows up so right. uh, I, I can I can understand where he's coming from with the with the title. In fact, I just moved my seats last year up to the town bank tower due to mobility issues, you know, balance and that sort of thing, arthritic knees. I just right. can't go up and down those stadium steps anymore. So my wife is thrilled that we have the comfort of that, that tower. I, I just don't like sitting up so high and trying to follow the ball when I'm so used to sitting five rows up and, and just right behind the pirate bench and being able to see things, you know, just, just so close up. It's a, it's an adjustment for me, but, uh, but we enjoy it. So before we dive any deeper into some of these stories from the Logan years, et cetera, um, wanted to work in reverse to back during your recruitment to East Carolina. And then also during your time at East Carolina as a student, but just, um, you referenced and being recruited there during um, the fall of 1970, I guess it was. And obviously that's when the horrific tragedy with the Marshall plane crash occurred. Um, I guess that what that was during your senior year of high school. I, I was in high school and I, I remember the Greensboro paper that was front page. Uh, and you know, yeah, I was in, I was still a senior in high school. Um, I, I just have a vivid memory of that being on the front page. But uh, that was the year before I got to, to East Carolina. So we had John Cazaza on the show. And I mean, you can imagine the emotions for him. He just he said the the wrong team won that day. He said I'd have given anything for Marshall to have uh, won that game, um, given what happened and. In um, I guess it was 2007, um, a game where we were playing for the Conference USA East Division title, uh, Skip Holt's third year up there in Huntington. And my family and I were there, and we had been to the Spring Hill Cemetery prior to the game and actually ran into somebody who was on that team uh, from Marshall but injured and, ob and obviously not on the flight. So that, that was a pretty kind of an eerie feeling. <laughs> That would be very surreal. And uh, Billy Wallace um, sat a couple of rows in front of me for many years, you know, before he passed away a few years ago. And of course, he, he was on that same team with Johnny Cazaza. Um, yeah, that would, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine that, you know, particularly playing, playing on the line, banging into somebody for three hours, and then the poor guy losing his life just a few hours later. That would be just a, just a terrible thing. And during your brief time uh, in the program there, the you know, once you came to East Carolina from the Citadel, you know, do you have a Sonny Randall story or two? Obviously, Coach Randall, um, quite the personality, um, a good family friend of ours, another good family friend of ours, uh, Greg Burke, uh, who played for Coach Randall. Uh, right. he, he's certainly shared some of those. 
Well, I, I, you know, I didn't spend much time around uh, Coach Randall, but, um, so I don't really have any stories. Um, I know Billy Tart told me that uh, the Citadel, our, our freshman team, we came to Greenville, freshman, and and we played up in Greenville in the rain, and and we just luckily won the game. And Billy Tart told me that. You talk about a Randall story. I don't know if I should say this, but I guess I will, because uh, Coach Randall, of course, has passed away. But Billy Tart told Billy and I became very good friends. We actually lived together in a house a few years later in Greenville. But uh, Billy said after that game against the Citadel that Randall made everybody in the locker room get on their knees, and he said, "You you you, you guys are dogs. You played like dogs, and you're going to be treated like dogs the rest of the day." That was just how Sonny was. I mean, he was a he was a man's man. He was a player's coach. Um, I liked him a lot. And everybody that played for him loved the guy. Uh, but, but yeah, I just went through winter drills and, and, and some spring practice. So I don't really have any, any stories like Greg would have. I, I came in, you know, with Danny Kepley's class. Now, now you talk about some characters. And, of course, working at the uh, elbow room during the off season. I think the elbow was probably the football team's favorite hangout. So I got to know those guys really, really well. And uh, you talk about some some stud ball players. Uh, Kenny Moore was probably the biggest guy we had on the team at, at 250. Now, ACC guys, you know, they, they averaged 250. But Kenny, I think, was the biggest guy we had back then. But he was a strong, strong dude. Uh, tough, tough defensive lineman. But Butch Strauderman, you know, a really muscular linebacker uh, out of Harrisburg, Virginia. He and Kepley were, the, were like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That's what we call them. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we, we had some characters that just uh, – Billy Hibbs. We had guys that just enjoyed each other. You know, Carl Summerall was the quarterback. Don Shank was the fullback. Uh, Carl Lester was a year ahead, uh, as was uh, Dan Killebrew and uh, Tom Frazier, heavy head. You know, Greg Troop was in that that uh, class ahead of me. But uh, just a bunch of guys that loved each other, loved to have a good time. Uh, once in a while, there'd be a skirmish with the guys from Camp Lejeune. Now, you know, we love the military today, but back in the early 70s, you know, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, and, and sometimes on a Friday and Saturday night, you know, the, the Marines would, would come to the college town looking for the college girls, and, and it just didn't mix well. Um, so there was some <laughs> out there on Cotant Street. I mean, there were some wild scenes from time to time. But, uh, you know, that was that was 40 years ago, Bubba. And, right. You know, we, we always asked for a college ID. That was to keep the, the riffraff out and the military out, just to keep it a college bar. Right. But, uh, that's just the way it was back then. Speaking of Cotant Street, uh, you've heard about the Halloween riot. Uh, right. It's not football related, but it's elbow room related. You may have seen, this was October 75, you, you may have seen an orange T-shirt with, with a pumpkin and a gas mask on it. I don't know if you've seen that. Your dad. Well, I don't believe I have. Okay. Well, it said first annual Halloween riot, October something, 1975. Well, they're, they're out there. Um, well, well, that was when we had, uh, uh, did you hear about the Halloween riot? I have to. Oh, okay. I mean, not, a, not a ton of stories, but yes, I, I certainly, well, it, it, certainly it, am aware. It was Halloween night and the bars were just packed. You know, the buck, the attic, the elbow room. And uh, the fire marshal wanted to close every, everybody down because they were overcrowded. Well, unfortunately, the Greenville police decided to throw tear gas into the bars to throw everybody out in the streets. And uh, you can go back and read about all that. Well, me and another guy had the bright idea to get T-shirts printed. And, and we did. And it's just that. It was an orange T-shirt, and on the front, it had the date, and on the back, it had a pumpkin with a gas mask on it, like a jack-o'-lantern with a gas mask. 
So I was going to sell these at the front door of the elbow room because I was working the door. And I had it t- tacked up there, and I was selling them for like 10 or 15 bucks. I don't know. And Danny Brissetti, the owner, came and said, you can't do this. We just met with the mayor and the police chief, and the, they want to close us down. And he said, you, can't, you can't say it's the first annual as if we're going to do this every year. I'm getting off topic here. but uh, that, That's but, okay. It's a tr- tremendous you, story. Your dad will know all about this. I've still got the T-shirt. Your dad may have one he, as well. But uh, those are just some of the crazy times that we had back there. Yes. I, um, after the show, we'd love to to have you text me a picture of that t-shirt yeah, so I can check that out. But, uh, you know, what are your memories there? Um, you know, you know, during your years as a student and then also, you know, just there in Greenville, like you mentioned, uh, managing the elbow room, um, of the, all the success that was being had, you know, during the Randall years and also the, the Pat Dye, of course, coach Dye came in, uh, there in, I guess, 74. So, you, you you were consistently winning, you know, seven, eight, nine games a year. Those boys, those boys were, you know, I just wasn't committed. It, it probably wasn't even good enough to have played. I would have practiced a lot. But those were some good football players. And, and Coach Randall put together a great staff. And they won the Southern Conference, was it three years in a row, I believe? And, I believe uh, that's correct. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, have to, I have to say this for my Citadel boys. I, I admire anybody that stayed at the Citadel for four years and graduated. And the Citadel actually came to Greenville in 74. It would have been my senior class. It was a, it was a nationally televised game on ABC. And uh, East Carolina won the game, I, I want to say 41 to 20. 41 to 21 or something, but the, I was so anxious to see who was still around from, from Charleston. So after the game, uh, I went down to the buses and sure enough that, you know, we probably had 20 in the recruiting class back in, in 71. And they were just a handful of guys left that I remembered, but bless their hearts, they stuck it out. But it was a big deal because it was nationally televised on ABC. And I think it was our homecoming game. But, but uh, you know, Randall put together some really good football teams. Um, I know uh, one, one thing that sticks out, Richmond was really good. They had a fullback, Barty Smith. And uh, they were coming to town. And it was for the conference championship. And we had a linebacker, Gary Nicholson. Uh, Gary's got a, a Facebook page, I think, uh, the, the football, ECU football. But uh, – Gary was in the middle. He was playing Mike. And uh, I don't know if I should say this, but I will. Uh, Joe Hallow was a great supporter. He was Pirate Club president for a few years, but he he owned the, one of the uh, beer distributorships there in Greenville. So I knew him real well from, from managing the uh, elbow room. And uh, he decided that we needed to, slow Barty Smith down any way that that we could. So uh, for lack of better words, there was a bounty on Barty Smith. And uh, sure enough, I don't know if it was the first or second half, but Barty Smith, and he was a big old fullback. He must have weighed about 230 or 240, but he came barreling up the middle and he hit Gary Nicholson. Or I should say Gary hit him head on. And they both went down, and uh, they stayed down. But Gary got back up first, and uh, Barty never came back in the game. And for anybody that hears this and was around during those years, they'll remember that hit. But uh, that's one play I'll never forget. And, of course, Pat Dye came right after that, and I remember – we were going to Chapel Hill. Mike Weaver was the quarterback. And on Friday night before the game, Clarence Stasevich died. And you may have heard about this story. And there was some talk about whether or not we should play the game. But it wasn't much of a discussion. And Pat Dye, as he said, took his skinny leg little boys from down east over to Chapel Hill, and we wore 
Bill Dooley's Tar Heels out. <laughs> they, they had a fullback called uh, named Mike Voigt, and they got the ball first, and they drove down the field and scored and made it seven to nothing. And we got the ball, and they had never seen an option attack like that before. And, buddy, that was one of the most fun games a Pirate fan has ever witnessed. And you, you know the story, 38 to 17. And uh, that was, at the time, the biggest athletic victory in East Carolina history. And I remember watching on Sunday at noon on WFNY TV, Woody Durham doing the Bill Dooley, doing the Bill Dooley show, you know, those 30 minute shows. Right. Bill Dooley apologizing to his Tar Heel fans saying, this will never happen again. So <laughs> that yep. was that was a great memory, and, and Pat Dye was everybody's hero from then on. Definitely remember hearing all about that game uh, from my dad. And then um, another game I heard a lot about from my dad was that 19, I believe it was 1977. I went back to confirm that date. Uh, when we were 8-2 and two and then got beat by William & Mary, um, where, where my dad said you know, it, was, it looked like we may be headed to the Peach Bowl. Uh, so you you had had a eight and two season up to that point with a three point loss at South Carolina and a two point loss at Louisiana, or you know or Southwestern Louisiana as they were known at the time, uh, and you had opened the year with back to back wins over ACC opponents in the NC State and Duke, and uh, and then just unable to get it done uh, against William and Mary um, in that season finale and. 77. Um, do you have any memories of that? Because I believe I, that, that was the, I do the, not, the, the, but, the game where you had a, had the uh, former former coach, was it Jim Johnson, come off the sideline? Oh, oh yeah. That, get, was, get, that, was, tackle. that was the Oyster Bowl. I was yeah, there. Yeah, the o Oyster Bowl. Yep. Was play, was played, at, played at Foreman Field uh, there in, in Norfolk uh, where where yep. Old Dominion now, you know, has, has built Ballard Stadium. Jim, Jim Johnson was standing on about the, the 10 or 15 yard line in a trench coat. <laughs> and yes, I remember that. He just came right off the sideline and just clipped the guy at his, uh, at his knees. I do remember that. Yep. So yeah, that had to be a pretty, pretty surreal scene there, like something out of a dream. Um, but kind of, Going back to the to the Logan years, uh, because I know that's where you were traveling on a weekly basis to, to see the Pirates, be it in Greenville or on the road, and you had the opportunity to develop uh, friendships. I'm sure, you know, like I know you're friends to this day with Jeff Connors, who we have doing absolute empowerment on a weekly basis here, and uh, he'll be back here in just a, a week or so, uh, I believe it's September 4th, that he will have Terrence Copper, former Pirate wide receiver. T. Cop will be on the show. But uh, not only uh, Coach Connors, but I know you're also very close with um, Mark Crandall. Yeah. Um, I've known Jeff for 30 years, and uh, he has uh, – He's just been a very, very dear friend. When he left to go to UNC, there's there's a lot of backstory I won't get involved with. You know, some people abandoned Jeff, and uh, I did not. I remember telling him when he left uh, on the phone. I was in Georgia, and I said, Jeff, I said, I'm not a UNC fan, but I am a Jeff Connors fan. And uh, I, I remember when, when he came, uh, when UNC came back, I think it was 2007. Chuck Pagano was the defensive coordinator. And uh, that was the game that we kicked a field goal on the last play of the game to beat UNC. Was that yeah, that, that, that is correct un, okay. under, uh, under Butch Davis. Yep. And I went around after the game uh, outside the visitor's locker room. I remember standing beside Terry Holland. Terry Holland was standing out there. But uh, Chuck Pagano came out first. And he was surprised to see me. Um, 
And I said, is, is Jeff still in there or had, is he on the bus? And he said, no, he's still in there. So, so Chuck and I talked for a few minutes. It was good to see him. And then Jeff came out and he, he seemed kind of surprised to see me as well. But, you know, those, those things meant a lot to both of those guys that uh, I took the time to go around there and, and say hello to them. But I, I got to tell you, I've just, uh, in fact, I talked to Chuck about three or four weeks ago, but back to, back to Jeff, uh, this absolute empowerment website, Jeff is a very spiritual person and he's helped me with my spiritual life. And, uh, he's doing some very, very good things. I nominated Jeff for the East Carolina hall of fame, uh, six weeks ago, whenever it was back in July. And he deserves to be in there. Um, when, when John Gilbert came through Greensboro on the pirate armada back in May, I, I talked to John about the Hall of Fame just to kind of get some information. And I was surprised that he said he felt the Hall of Fame was becoming watered down. And I didn't understand what he meant by that. And he said he was going to move to have it every two years instead of inductees every single year. And that frankly bothers me. And sure enough, I talked with the committee I'm, I'm sorry, I heard that a committee member, Hall of Fame committee member, confirmed that they are moved, they have moved to having the Hall of Fame inductions every every two years. That, that is correct. Uh, Andrew Bays, you know, co-color yeah. analyst on our ECU Sports Network now, um, joined last year alongside Jeff Charles and and Andrew uh, did confirm that uh, here about three weeks ago. He was on uh, part of our the sports objective channel on uh, just another sports podcast with Stevie fly and Kyle Barber. And they had him on a preview in the pirate special teams. And, and he also wanted to discuss that. Uh, just saying, you know, if you have pirates like Jeff Connors, you know, Terry Holland, uh, Leonard Henry, and, you know, and I know there are others that I'm leaving out that should certainly be in. I mean, just, and you can only, you're only going to induct, I think in the typical class is four, and you're not going to have more than one or two of those being football players because you, you're including, you know, all 18 sports or whatnot that uh, is certainly not anywhere close to being watered down. Well, I agree, and I'm not going to get on a – Soapbox. <laughs> not going to get on a rant or a soapbox, but I'm just saying it's wrong. It is wrong. It's not It's not watered down. I do know, and, and, and I'm not going to get – political here but it's way too political they they said and your your source is correct they got to have a female and there was something else they had to have um and you know they're going to put a baseball player on there and i'm for that i'm all for that i'm all for gary overton and, and, and uh cliff godwin and if that just leaves four, two others i mean we got plenty of football players that are deserving but we also have some other people that are non-athletes but anyway, it's, I, I'm not bitter because Jeff did not get in on first ballot. But Jeff is very deserving. Leonard Henry is very deserving. There are others that are very deserving. But I'll, I'll just end it right there. People that have influence, whether it's you or, you know, other broadcasters or other people, on, on the on committees or donors, anybody that has influence, we need to get to John Gilbert and the committee and let them know that as pirate faithful, uh, they need to revisit that decision. Uh, but, you know, Jeff is certainly deserving. And Mark Crandall, um, I've, I've grown or come to know uh, pretty well the last few months or so. And here's how that came about. Um, last season, the letter winners game, um, I, I was, I was taking Jeff, Jeff, I take Jeff to a few games here, there up, up, up in the tower. He enjoys that. I'm glad to get him back involved in, in, in the football games. And I had an extra ticket and he said, do you mind if I, I bring Mark Crandall? I said, I'd love for Marcus to go with us. So I, I got to say hello again to Marcus Crandall and, uh, I, I, I said, hey, if I can help you with anything, just let me know. So we've become, you know, pretty good buddies. And uh, 
I told him, I said, you know, thinking back, I saw you play every single game live and in person. And, and he said, wow, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. And uh, we, we just got, you know, just kind of become close and, um, you know, I, I, I just want the guy to be successful. You know, he's, he's doing some things with the, with the uh, company he started up and, and uh, I just want to see him succeed. He's a quality guy, a really quality guy. And when you talk about pirates supporting pirates, that's what it's all about. It definitely is. And, uh, you know, with Marcus Crandall, you know, obviously he had a ton of good games, but uh, in addition to that South Carolina game um, in 1994, when we put 56 points on the Gamecocks, one of the games that stands out was when we defeated Miami, uh, who was ranked 12th at the time, 31 to six down in the fabled orange bowl. So I know you were there that night and, uh, you know, have a very interesting story about that night. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and so I'd love for you to share that one. Well, um, it, it is kind of comical. Uh, the more I, I talk about it, think about it, talk about it. Yeah. Danny Bersini and I went, went to Miami and uh, Chuck Pagano was the defensive coordinator there for Butch Davis. And uh, I called Chuck. I said, hey, Danny and I are coming down and, you know, we'd like to see you before the game. Say hello. He said, hey, great. He said, do you need some sideline passes? I said, sure, that'd be that'd be wonderful. So he arranged for that. And, and we, we saw him before the game and he gave us the passes. So, you know, Danny and I are standing down on about the, I don't know, maybe the 20, 25 yard line on the East Carolina side in the Orange Bowl. And uh, before too long, the game started, and here comes Orange Bowl security uh, wanting to know what we're, what we're doing down there. And we said, well, we got these passes. And they look, and they say, well, these, these passes say Miami bench. You can't stand down here. You know, we had on, you know, coaches, East Carolina shirts and East Carolina hats and khaki pants. You know, we looked like, I guess, East Carolina coaches, and they were kind of they, they were going to shoo us back up toward the bench. And they saw our pastor said Miami bench. He said, you got to walk walk over there. So, so Danny and I walk around the end zone, and we get to about the 20, 25-yard line on the Miami side, and we stop, and we're standing there. And, of course, we got on our East Carolina gear. And before long, here comes a guy with a walkie-talkie. He said, what are you doing? And we said, well, somebody told us we had to stand over here. And he looks at our passes, and he says, well, this says Miami bench. You, you got to go over there. He's pointing at the bench area. So we said, well, okay. So we started easing over toward the bench. Well, we're not about to go stand inside that bench area. So we go behind the bench and, uh, you know, who, here we are again, looking like ECU coaches and their players sitting on the bench, standing around the bench, kind of looking at us. Here's a coach or two with chalkboards, you know, kneeling down and, looking at us we're very uncomfortable so here comes another guy with a walkie-talkie what are you doing and we tell him the story well chuck pagano gave us these passes and we're told we have to stand here in the bench area he gets on his walkie-talkie up to the press box we hear chatter I said you can't stand here i said we don't want to stand here and so after a while we just said to heck with it we walked back around and went up and sat up in the stands and watched the rest of the game but uh it was it was comical at the time when you when you think back on it but after the game of course the pirates just wore miami out and i watched that game again not just a few days ago and of course marcus had a had a great game but uh we were down at, at the locker room waiting for some of the guys to come out. And Jeff Connors comes out with a game ball, big, big smile on his face. He said, look, look at this. Steve gave me the game ball. We said, man, that's, that's great. And, and, you know, when you think about it, we went toe to toe with the Miami hurricane on their home field. And I mean, Jeff had been there, what, six years or so building the strength and conditioning of these guys. And, and, and we were animals. I mean, we had a huge offensive line and I mean, we were studs and we went toe to toe with those guys that night and we did not blink one bit. And uh, I thought it was wonderful that, that Steve gave, gave Jeff, 
Jeff that game ball, and it's it's up in his man cave to this very day. He's he's got some game balls, but he's most proud of that one. And it was just a testament to how how far he built our program in in from ninety one to ninety six. But that was a great great win. It was a great night, and it, it's a memory I'll never forget. Yeah, definitely not. Uh, that's one of those you definitely recall where you were, and I, you know, no matter you know if you were a pirate fan in that era, as I was, um, you know, I was. 15 years old, um, playing JV football at West Forsyth High School. And I remember I had a teammate, you know, who's a bandwagon Miami fan. And after the 28-7 loss that the Pirates suffered to Southern Miss on Thursday night, the you know, nine days prior. A week you know, before, he, that's right. Yeah. He, had been, he had been running his mouth at school and, uh, you know, said, man, we're going to kill y'all. And I said, I said, we'll see. I said, that's why you play the game. Southern Miss is good. I said, no, so we'll see. Uh, and so, yeah, that following Monday after that uh, 31-6 beatdown in the Orange Bowl, you know, he was dodging me, uh, you know, huh. doing everything. He, he saw me coming and turned around and headed another way. It was hilarious because he didn't think I saw him. And I saw him, like, trying to, uh, trying to act like he hadn't seen me. Pretty funny. Well, that was a great team. You know, that 96 team was really, really good. And, of course, you know, we didn't go to a bowl. But uh, th th do we have a minute? I and there's something else I want to say about that 96 year. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead and um, and continue on with, with, with your thought about the 96 team. We, uh, you know, we opened up at home against East Tennessee State. And uh, then we went to West Virginia. Right. And and we our offense just could could not get going until the last possession. And Marcus drove us down the field. We were down ten to three. And I had forgot that this was the first year that the NCAA adopted overtime it was in ninety six. So we scored, made it ten to nine. Well, I'm sitting up in the stands with my dad and Danny and Laura Logan. Laura's sitting right beside me. And I guess everybody thought we were going to kick it and send it into overtime. Well, Steve decided to go for two. And I remember Lars thinking, and Lars said, well, we got overtime. And I looked and I saw the team go back on the field. And I said, we're going for two. And Lars said, we're going for two. I thought she was going to faint. Well, <laughs> as you know, Marcus rolled out right. And he may even tell you, I'm not going to criticize him that he, he probably threw it a step late, but we did not convert and we lost the game. Well, Steve caught all kinds of criticism, you know, after that. Everybody criticized Steve all week. Well, we went to South Carolina the next weekend, and that was in a monsoon. It rained and rained and rained and rained, and we won 23 to 7, okay? And here's where I'm going with this. You've seen this clip a hundred times. Steve is in the post-game interview room, and he's got this intense, wide-eyed, scary look on his face. And he says something to effect, to the effect, when you come to East Carolina, when you play at East Carolina, when you coach at East Carolina, you go for it every time. Write it. And he stands up and walks out. Something like, you don't come to East Carolina with a weak heart. Well, that was in response to all that criticism he had caught all week for not kicking and going into overtime. And I bet everybody remembers that clip, but they don't remember why and when and where that was taken. Yeah, John, I remember that quote by uh, Coach Logan very well after that 96 South Carolina game. You know, that was uh, very indicative of, of, you know, what it is to be a pirate. And, uh, you know, that's a quote that has really been used um, very frequently over the last few years. Um, 94.3 The Game, Pirate Radio, and also the university putting it on the, the video board. Um, so, you know, I, I like seeing that, you know, tying things back to our storied past. 
Yeah, and uh, you know, I've always remembered that, and I just thought you know, your listeners would would uh, like to uh, to be reminded of of when, why, and where, as I said, that came from. But uh, that that was a great year. Uh, you know, we, we, we finished the 96 season in Charlotte uh, against NC State. And that was one of my favorite games. You know, we won that game 50 to 29. And uh, Danny Gonzalez was the quarterback. You know, Marcus did not finish that season. He only played eight games and uh, he got hurt. But that was the Scott Harley uh, game where he had 351 yards and it's, it's really one of my favorite games. I love, you know, uh, Chuck and Kathy Harley, you know, great, great pirate fans to, to this very day. But, uh, Scott's always been one of my favorite players, but I was really hoping that coach Logan would let Marcus come out at the, uh, and take the last snap at the end of the game. And he did. I don't know if fans remember that yeah definitely definitely do he got a big standing ovation he did and uh i just thought it was a great great way to to end his pirate career uh, and, and and quickly i remember marcus's very first game as a pirate we opened up on thursday night in greenville on espn against syracuse and it was a drizzly rainy night, but we all wondered who our quarterback was going or how our quarterback would be because we had Michael Anderson the year before. But Marcus uh, made his his preview in that game and we lost it. But boy, we, we left that stadium knowing that that Steve Logan had found a quarterback because he could zip that ball. And I knew right right away after I saw him throw the ball a few times that uh, we had a successor to, to a Jeff Blake. So uh, I remember that specifically about Marcus, his, his very first start as a Pirate, and then the last snap he took there in Charlotte. Yeah, I remember that Syracuse game as well. And uh, I, I recall those touchdown passes to Morris Letcher, and we, we've had Morris on the show. And uh, – and the Pirates were right there with the orange or orange men as they were at that time. And, um, you know, the orange men pulled away in the second half. But um, and he, speaking of Coach Logan, um, he, I know during those years uh, you were traveling to all the road games. You had the opportunity, as you told me off the air, uh, to get to know Coach Logan's parents, obviously Coach from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. That was that was mentioned pretty frequently. Um, pretty unique town name, but uh, you know, what are your memories of getting to know uh, Coach Logan's parents? Well, I have wonderful memories of uh, Jim and Mary Sue Logan. They, of course, lived in Broken Arrow all their lives. Um, Steve Logan has some great genes. Uh, his father, Jim, died in 2017 at 97 years old, and his mom passed away two years ago at the age of 100. So, you know, Steve can do the Logan jo uh, Logan's own radio show for 30 more years, uh, it looks like, because uh, he's my age and uh, he's going to live a long, long time. But he, his parents are uh, were wonderful people. And I'll tell you how I got to know them. We went out to Tulsa um, in 2014 and I got to meet his parents there and, and uh, his sister and, and I think two of his brothers. But that was the first time I met them. And I started thinking, you know, if I was the head coach um, of, of a major college football program, my dad would love to get all the information he could on, on my football team. Well, back during Steve's tenure, his parents were in their 70s, and they, they couldn't get on the Internet and on the computer and keep up with the Pirates. So I mailed them every week a packet. Uh, I would print articles from the Daily Reflector, from the Raleigh News and Observer, anything I could find, you know, after the game and, and the game coming up. And, and I would send it to them, mail it to them. And, and they, it was like a care package of information. And they really appreciated that. And uh, I still have letters uh, today. Uh, that Jim Logan sent me with just corresponding back and forth. And we would talk on the phone at least once, maybe twice a week about the upcoming game. We, we became very close friends. Well, it was either at, at, at a UAB game or a Memphis game. I don't remember, but at the team hotel, um, I asked Steve uh, prior to the game, I said, how, how are your parents getting to the stadium? And he said, well, I, I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. I said, well, well, tell them I'll be happy to take them over there. 
So I, uh, I did, and it became a tradition. They, they were able to make some games that were, you know, close to them. Example, uh, Houston, Hattiesburg, Birmingham, Fort Worth, um, th th those kind of places that they could drive to. They hated to fly. And so if they got to a game, I was their escort. And we just got to be very close. We'd go to and from the game and then have dinner afterwards at the hotel. And they became very, very close friends of mine. But, you know, I, I've, I know you've got a podcast going that is uh, Coach's Kids. Well, think about Coach's parents. You know, they, they go through the same ups and downs, you know, that the, the Coach's kids do. But uh, we went to bowl games together and, and, and a lot of those road games. And uh, I have wonderful memories of, of Steve's parents. And they really, really enjoyed pirate football. And uh, one, one, one memory I, I, I'll never forget, uh, you know, on a road game, you got three buses that leave the hotel for the stadium. The offense is in the, the first bus, the defense is in the second bus, and then the third bus are cheerleaders and, and what band goes out there and, and the medical trainers and, and some of the media and, and that sort of thing. And uh, we were told we could fall in behind the third bus and go to the stadium in, in the police escort. And uh, we did that numerous times, and they got the biggest thrill out of riding to the stadium with the police escort, particularly in Memphis, because the, the Shelby County motorcycle guys, they use motorcycles, and we had about eight or ten of those guys that would just fly by us from intersection to intersection, and we called them the, the, the Memphis or uh, Shelby County Cowboys. But they got the biggest kick out of riding to that game in uh, in Memphis with a police escort. But I, it's just a lot of fun to to think about the memories with uh, Jim and Mary Sue Logan. And uh, I know the last time that uh, uh, I saw them was under the Skip Holtz era. Uh, I when when Steve was let go, I stopped going on the road. And uh, two years into Skip's tenure. It was, I think, 2005, um, we played out at Tulsa, and my wife and I decided we wanted to go visit Jim and Mary Sue, and so we made that trip, and they were just delighted to see us again. But, uh, you know, coaches' parents have uh, a lot of ups and downs, just like the coaches' kids do. No doubt. Uh, that's, that's an excellent story. That's something I don't believe I've ever heard. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of Steve Logan stories, uh, be it from him directly or from uh, Pirate fans or members of the media. But I uh, do not recall hearing that. I know Pirate fans uh, will enjoy that story. And um, you know, speaking of Coach Logan, you know, I, I know you can appreciate this. I'm um, getting to know him the way you did personally, in addition to just um, – hearing his coaching show down through the years and, uh, and just his personality, you know, his, uh, he, he definitely has the ability to entertain on the radio and uh, he is back once again uh, on the radio with the Logan zone, uh, I believe, and, or whatever they're calling it all 94, three, the game and their uh, network of stations now. Yeah. And uh, I, I got a chance to hear him Friday at five and it was the, the, the same Steve Logan. I haven't talked to him in a few years. I, I do want to hook up with him because as I said, I've got some uh, letters from his dad. I think he and Nate and Vince, his two sons would enjoy having, but uh, the last time I actually saw Steve was uh, the night that he and David Garrard were inducted into the ECU hall of fame. And, uh, Joyce Stroud invited uh, me and my wife over to her house because Steve and Laura were over there with a couple of other folks. And uh, that was nice of her to do. And I got to visit with Steve and uh, share a couple of hours with him. And, you know, he had been uh, over to, I think it was, was it Germany or Berlin? I think he'd coached at, but uh, we, we caught up and, and just shared some, some memories non-football memories. He doesn't like to talk football when he's not working, but he's, he's just a great person. He's funny as he can be. He's very witty. He's smart as a whip. Um, but that was the last time I actually saw him. And I know he spends a lot of time at the beach now. He still has a place in Raleigh, but uh, he's doing very well. And I, I know he's been to a couple of games last year 
and uh, I'm sure he'll get back to a few more this year, but I'm glad he's back on the radio. He's very entertaining. Yeah, you speak of him attending a couple of Pirate games in 2022. I saw uh, one game he was there in what is now the uh, – the uh, so-called premium lot, uh, the former white lot, uh, right behind Town Bank Tower, and he was uh, doing a little tailgating uh, with some of the ninety-four-three crew and uh, T Cop Terrence Copper. Yeah, and uh, I didn't see him at the game. I know he was uh, a level above me in in someone's suite. It may have been Henry's. I'm not sure, but I believe he was with Doug Martin only because I saw a picture on social media, I think the next day, but he's laid back, you know, he's just a laid back guy. And, uh, you know, I haven't bothered him because he doesn't really want to be bothered. He just loves to fish. He loves to drink wine. He loves, uh, his blues music. And, uh, he's, he's just one of us now. But taking a look at some more of coach Logan's excellent teams, that 99 team got off to a five and O start. Um, you know, obviously one of the best starts in school history and, um, you know, Kevin Monroe, we had him on our pirate preview this week. Um, you know, and then obviously as we're recording this, um, you know, folks, uh, ha- have heard that already, but, um, you know, Kevin was talking about that 99 team and getting off to that five and O start with the wins over West Virginia and Charlotte Duke at home going, the Columbia, South Carolina, and spoiling South Carolina's season, or well, not, excuse me, not season opener, but um, home opener under um, Lou Holt, uh, his first season there. And uh, I remember the, the Gamecock band spelling out Lou, uh, which was pretty comical. And then um, we were dealing with Hurricane Floyd, got to play Miami at Carter Finley Stadium. And um, that's well documented um, coming back from. 20 points down, 23 to three there early in the second half. And then I went up to West Point and took care of uh, Army um, before losing our first game of the season against Southern Miss. So what are your memories of that 5-0 and start uh, where you know, David Garrard, Jamie Wilson, Leonard Henry, you know, Keith Stokes, um, obviously I'm naming all offensive guys, but then, then uh, on the defensive side you had guys like uh, Pernell. Jeff Carr. Well, I, Jeff Carr and yep. – um, and so forth. Norris McCleary uh, making so many plays. Uh, that's uh, 96 is probably, probably my favorite season. 99 is probably my second favorite other than 91. Of course, 91 is just a, well, that's a, that's a one off, but 99 is probably my second best season. That's South Carolina game. Um, you know, Lou Holtz opened up uh, at, NC State, where he had, of course, coached before, and then opened up at Georgia. And then his third game was his first home game, as you said, as ho- uh, head coach in, in Columbia. And we, we wore him out 21-3. to three. And do you remember who Lou's uh, offensive coordinator was that year? Let's see. I'm, I, I guess Skip. It was Skip Holtz. Yep. It sure was. Yep. Who thought he would have been our head coach? You know what? Uh, six years later, because but, later on, uh, you know there was you, you wonder how things went down. But uh, you know, Lou had to fire Skip. <laughs> I, I didn't remember that, or or, 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 cho- or chose to fire him at least. If yeah, well, at, you know, after that uh, that South Carolina win, it was the Hurricane Floyd game. Well, you know, we were stuck. We couldn't get back to Greenville. Well, Lou Holtz graciously allowed ECU to use his practice field. Well, that lasted two days, and he said we were tearing it up. It was just too much to have the Pirates and the Gamecocks practice on that field. So we had to go and practice on a local high school field for the balance of that week uh, before we ended up, of course, playing Miami and Raleigh. I don't know if people realize that, but that was that, that's another show altogether is that week. But uh, I remember after we beat Miami uh, – I, I, I can still see the Hart twins, Scott Richards, Jason Nichols, uh, right there on the first row behind the bench uh, uh, up in the stands, cheering on the Pirates. And, and uh, you know, we won that thing. And um, I know right after the game, uh, Steve went up uh, that, that end zone. There was a building in that uh, end zone at Carter-Finley. And I guess it was a press room or something. 
And uh, we went up there, and, and I guess there were no cell phones in 99. I don't know. But Steve had gone to a telephone to call his dad. And as soon as he got off the phone with his dad, um, he came out, and he looked just drained. And he saw me, and he just kind of collapsed in my arms. And he said, wasn't that something? And it, and it shocked me, you know, because that's unlike Steve. You know, he's, he's kind of a Clint Eastwood cool customer kind of guy, but he was just absolutely drained, but excited. And, uh, I thought it was neat. The first thing he wanted to do was call his dad. So that was, uh, that was just a great, great night. And I remember him also saying he immediately started thinking about the army game and having to go to West Point. Cause he said, after this, we, we just can't afford to have a letdown. And that was Steve Logan. You know, you've heard him say more than one time, Bubba, after, after a win, he'd walk off the field, and the first thing he'd be thinking about is the next opponent. You know, it was like he just couldn't enjoy a victory for 24 hours. But uh, he was scared to death of that Army game because of all of the, the excitement and the drama of the hurricane of everything we had to go to uh, go through of the kids getting back to Greenville and seeing their apartments underwater, losing everything. But we went up there and took care of business. I, I've got the score here, 33 to 14, but that was a huge win that year. Um, all things considered. And then of course, uh, NC state came to Greenville for the very first time. And that was a huge, huge win 23 to six. Uh, and we went to the Mobile Bowl, and uh, we were ready, and we played hard, but they had LaDamian Tomlinson, and uh, we lost 28-14, but we were very, very competitive, and we, we deserved, you know, a bowl because we hadn't been in a couple of years. But uh, 99 was a really, really good year. Yeah, and that game in Mobile definitely got tired of hearing that froghorn. Yeah. Well, it, did you go to Fort Worth? We played them later on in uh, Fort Worth. I, I've I've never been able to. I've never been to the state of Texas. Period. Well, they've got a, a golf cart that that looks like that frog, and that's irritating as heck. But uh, I do remember watching those games on uh, TV. Um, you know, I guess I remember one in two thousand and one. You know that year. You know, we had so many leads and, um, you know, found a way to hold on after relinquishing those leads early in the year. And then there later in the year, it came back to bite us uh, a time or two. But, um, but yes, I remember the old Amon G. Carter Stadium before uh, they have the, the beautiful stadium that they do now. And out, out there in Fort Worth, they've got this, uh, it's not a foghorn, it's just some kind of, I don't know, loud like a train horn or something. It's, it's irritating. Um, but the next year, you know, year 2000, we went eight and four. And uh, the two games I remember most about that, um, at Southern Miss, it's known as the Mud Bowl, I, I believe. Yeah, it was like Mud Bowl Part 2 because I, I know watching that 83 highlight film as much as I did growing up uh, when I was in elementary school, had that thing memorized. And uh, in that game uh, was a – mud bowl because there were tornado warnings not too far from from uh, Hattiesburg. It rained and rained and rained. And I remember there the, the Southern Miss locker room, field house or whatever was under construction. It was being remodeled. And East Carolina had to dress in an old gymnasium, you know, back around the the uh, the, the stands. And there was no locker rooms. It was it was like a basketball court with folding chairs. And I don't know how they handled the security of, of watches and, and bill folds and wallets and that sort of thing. But that was just the strangest thing. But the thing about that game, that was a man's man's game. If that makes sense. I mean, it was a brawl and uh, we won. And something, and something weird was like 14 to nine or it was, it was 14 to nine. I had to look the score up, but I mean, that was just a gut check kind of game. And, uh, you know, it's hard to beat Southern Miss in Hattiesburg. It's hard to beat them in Greenville. But that was a heck of a win. Yeah, oddly enough, um, you know, we didn't have a ton of success against them in Hattiesburg. We 
we certainly had more success against them in Hattiesburg than we did at uh, Ficklin and Dowdy Ficklin. Yeah, exactly. And, and then, and I'm sorry to dictate this conversation, but I had to make note of the Gallery of Furniture Bowl, you know? Yeah, the, 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 get that galleryfurniture.com bowl, that uh, matchup against Texas Tech. Um, Mike Leach, who unfortunately we lost last year, what a gym he was. I, anytime he spoke to the media, and, um, you know, I, I would – during the summer months, especially that or Christmas break, when I had you know more time on my hands to, to watch that sort of thing, I would search Coach Leach and uh, you know watch him speaking with the media and the funny things that he would say. And Russell McNeil was on his staff then, and uh, unfortunately we weren't able to to make that game, but definitely tuned in. And uh, what a first half that was, and uh, you know played some of the the best football you could play, and uh, we exploited them. Uh, I remember Rashawn Burns and, you know, the fullback dive. You know, he was a very versatile tight end. Uh, he could tight end slash fullback, and uh, he really hurt them with a fullback dive there in the first half. I believe – you're right, and, and I believe it was Mike Leach's first year as a head coach there. And I believe Ruffin was the defensive coordinator. But uh, you mentioned the first half, and I made a note here. I, that may have been the, the best first half of football I've ever seen an ECU team play. I mean, it was total domination on both sides of the football. And, and it's like Steve Logan said at halftime, and this was, of course, in the paper and all that uh, internet later on. He told that football team, he said, look, Texas Tech has a storied history, and they're not going to lay down. They're going to come out in the second half, and you better be ready because they're going to come out and hit us right in, 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 you know, right in the mouth. And they did. You know, the, the final score was forty to twenty-seven. It was not easy. Oh. But, I mean, and I forget the I forget the halftime score. We were way up, but uh, that was that was the best half of football I believe I've ever seen a Pirate football team play. And one of the things I couldn't obviously fully appreciate since I was not there um, outside of the game itself, you know, which was played at the old Astrodome, uh, which would have been um, neat to visit. But, uh, you know, on the way to the game, I just remember hearing people talking about this. Wasn't there an ice storm? I, I don't remember that, that I don't remember. Okay. But, um, but, yeah, that, that first half, David Garrard, I talked about uh, the running game. Um, I remember Keith Stokes, he, he took a punt back to the house, it seems like. Um, yeah, everyone was making plays. The defense was shutting down Cliff Kingsbury and that Texas Tech offense. And then, like you said, um, they, they started – Finding some success in the second half, but um, and Cliff Kingsbury went on to to be the head coach at his alma mater, and then um, of course the Arizona Cardinals, and now I believe he's on Lincoln Riley staff in an analyst role or something of that nature out at USC. Right. But um, it, kind of shifting gears from the the Logan era to the Skip Holtz. Years, um, Coach Holtz, like you mentioned, he had been with his dad at South Carolina and that staff. Uh, there was a transition taking place um, with them choosing to go in a different direction after Coach Holtz did have a lot of success there and got that program um, on more solid footing than it had been in quite some time. They were bringing in Steve Spurrier. Um, Skip um, was needing, needing a job and, uh, you know, Fortunately, Terry Holland um, you know, saw you know, that successful experience that he had had up at UConn uh, when UConn was 1AA as it was at the time. And uh, that, that was a heck of a hire to be able to bring in a proven head coach. And then he assembled a very experienced staff. I think Skip was a, was a fantastic hire. And, and he did a great job. And you're right, we, we had a great staff. And uh, I had uh, I had moved to Georgia at the time, um, but I was still going to a lot of the games. Now, I, as I said, I did not when, when Steve was was let go in two thousand two. That pretty much ended my my road trip experiences. Um, I, I 
I didn't quit the Pirates Club. I still kept my, my season tickets. You know, I, I didn't like the fact uh, that, that Steve was let go like he was, but, you know, I'm not going to go there. But I just lost my taste to, to put so much time and effort into traveling on the road. But we, we continued to increase our Pirate Club donations, and we kept our season tickets that we've had for 30-some years. But uh, I, I just watched the home games, I mean, the uh, road games on TV. But uh, I was over there in Georgia in SEC country. And so, uh, you know, everybody had a lot of respect for East Carolina because, you know, mainly because of the Logan years, quite frankly. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the games that I remember most about Skip's tenure was the 2008 West Virginia game in, uh, in Greenville. That was a heck of a game. I think it was, what, 24 to 3? And Yeah, that's and, correct. That solidified nationally, you know what what Skip was had done there, uh, you know, getting that program back to national respect. I mean, that was just total domination of a ranked West Virginia team. What number three or four or five? They were ranked very high, and and then of course the uh, Conference USA Championship game in Greenville, where we beat Houston, uh, where we intercepted the ball late in the end zone, and I think it was uh, was it Colt McCoy? Was that the quarterback? Not McCoy. It was uh, doesn't matter. Uh, but but those two games stand out uh, the most to me. Now I mentioned being in SEC land. Um, two frustrating losses were the bowl games. You know where we lost to Kentucky and to Arkansas, and we should have won both of those games, as you know. Yeah, certainly uh, was that both of those. Um, you know the 08 team. And you're certainly right that we should have won that bowl game. Uh, they really overcame a lot as far as the number of injuries. Uh, I remember late in that season when we lost to, to Southern Miss, I believe it was 21 to three um, down there in Hattiesburg. You looked at the injury report, you had about 20 guys. It was insane. Um, but they overcame, uh, found a way to get it done um, at UAB, a place that we had historically struggled, and then uh, also you know, found a way in that conference championship game to go out to Tulsa and force seven turnovers. That's right. But, uh, yeah, those, those losses really hurt because you think about it, uh, we've had two 10-plus win seasons, 91 and then 2013, and uh, those two years and a, a few others, you know, there, there are five, six, seven seasons uh, where we won eight or nine games, but you really could have had 10 or 11 win seasons, and uh, those really hurt. Yeah, and, you know, just beating an SEC team is, is, is just a, a monumental feather in your cap. And we just, just fell short. Again, we should have won both games, but would have, could have, should have. That's the life of a pirate. No doubt. And uh, so, what are some of your top memories of the Ruffin McNeil years? Um, obviously, um, Coach Shank, uh, he, he was, I just thought about this because I heard an interview with him in the last couple days as he is now um, in that off the field role, high school relations, alumni relations, uh, which is an excellent move by Mike Houston. But um, Coach Shank, so many different stints at East Carolina. But, um, but Ruff and McNeil, it, just thinking of some of those wins, obviously, over the in-state teams, but then also Virginia Tech and you know, putting 70 on the Tar Heels um, there in 2014 when Shane Carden and, and Justin Hardy, Zay Jones um, and company really, really lit up the, the baby blue. Well, you just said it all right there. You know, Ruff had some really good, win great wins. And, I mean, look look at his first one in 2010 uh, at home against Tulsa when Dominique Davis threw the Hail Mary to, to, to win 51-49. I mean, what a start. I mean, what a way to start. And uh, he, he had some really, really good wins against ACC teams and, and on the road as well. Um, I know Cam Worthy. Uh, the, the Shane Card and Cam Worthy connection up in Blacksburg, uh, it just drove uh, Virginia Tech crazy for the, the way we came back on them. 
Uh, yeah, about 230, 240 yards um, that day as we exploited their man-to-man coverage at Bud Foster defense. But, uh, yeah, like you're saying, they were coming off a big win at the Horseshoe in Columbus over the Ohio State Buckeyes. Yeah, and then, you know, at home with, with James Summers, you know, Bud Foster, the renowned defensive coordinator, he, he, he could not stop James Summers. Um, was it 2014 or 15? I forget. 20, what 2015. Okay. 2015. I mean, what a great win at home that was. So, uh, you know, again, Vitek, UNC, NC State, Ruffin had some really, really uh, impressive wins. Now, you can say it was uh, Lincoln Riley. Doesn't matter. You know, the head guy is the one that that, that is responsible one way or the other. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest wart that I remember, and I'm not – criticizing Ruffin. He's a pirate. I love the guy. But that Central Florida loss at home when we came yeah. back when we came back and, and we had we had the game in hand and I mean who loses after going into victory formation? I don't know that that's ever been done before. But damn we found a way yeah, to lose. That, I'm pretty sure I mean I know um I know I've seen it happen at some point, but yeah, very rare there. And like you said, it's just such a shame. Twenty-six to nine deficit on senior night. Then you make that seventeen point fourth quarter comeback. You get the defensive stop you need after you take the thirty to twenty-six lead, I think it was, and then you have them on the ropes. And you know, we, we were, in my opinion, you know, you know, we were too afraid to. To hand the ball off, um, you know, and, and move forward. Instead, we went backwards and not to beat a dead horse. But I just remember when that happened, I, I look at my dad and I said, I, I really don't have a good feeling about this because, you know, we haven't defended the deep ball particularly well. And, you know, losing 20, 25 yards as we did, and we put UCF in a situation where they could complete an out route or two and then have a, heaved to the end zone, which they did, and it didn't go well. No, it didn't go well. And we I don't want to end uh, – I know we got to wrap this up. I don't want to end on a, on a sour note. But uh, No, we, cer- we certainly was, won't end with that. <laughs> that was, but, that uh, was probably the, the worst one. But um, you know, skipping from 2015 up to present, um, entering year five under Mike Houston – this program, uh, it was quite honestly in shambles when when he and this staff took over. He had the luxury of bringing a very quality staff, but also uh, staff that was familiar with East Carolina and guys like Dale Steele uh, in an off-the-field role, but Shank as offensive line coach, Donnie Kirkpatrick as OC, and Coach Houston well aware of what East Carolina was capable of. And he told us, he said, it's going to be year three. I remember he said it on air and he said it off air to us in the media. You got to be patient with us, um, but we're going to get it done. Year three, the Pirates went seven and five, unfortunately unable to play the bowl game. Year four, eight and five, win the bowl game in convincing fashion against Coastal Carolina. And this program is really trending back to where it can compete for conference championships in the American. I told Mike, and I'm not dropping names, and I don't know Mike that well. He wouldn't know my name if he if he walked in the room. But I told him at the Pirate Armada in Greensboro this past May, I, I just spoke with him briefly, and I said, I, I wanted you as our head coach, and I'll tell you why. I said, when you were at the Citadel, you went up to Columbia, and you took those Bulldogs, and, and you beat the Gamecocks. And I said, I've played in that stadium when I was at the Citadel as a freshman. And we got beat 35 to nothing. And I said, I, I said for you to take the, the Bulldogs and, and to go up there and beat the Gamecocks, I said, you're my kind of coach. And you've won everywhere you've been. And, and I was I was just thrilled that, that you came to East Carolina. He said, that was a good day. I said, I bet it was. So I, I think he's the right guy. And uh, I, I hope that we uh, – 
we have a good year. I want him to have a good year. I think we will have a good year. I, I'm optimistic about this year. Quarterback play. Definitely have a couple that are uh, that are talented in Mason Garcia and Alex Flynn. We just don't know hardly anything about them other than what we've been told. Uh, you know, and you know, unless you're going back to to what they were on the high school level, and you know, or unless you're extremely close to the program and have been able to watch practice. But um, very intrigued to see see Mason. You know, did I have the opportunity to be there in person when he got the start? against Navy uh, when Holton had COVID back in 2020. But um, that was the bulk of his playing experience. You, you know, you saw some packages just for him in the red zone back in 2021 last year. Um, I would have, you know, we were just in so many close games, but I thought there was a time or two, you know, be it against the Campbell or someone of that nature where we had a sizable lead and he played some, but I thought he could have played a little bit more, but uh, yeah, it, very excited to see, see Mason and possibly Alex on Saturday at the big house. Yeah. I wish he, he had played a little more uh, this past year. I'm not sure why he didn't, but I'm not a coach. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, and they were, you know, for full disclosure, as many Pirate fans are aware, you know, trying to preserve that red shirt, not playing in more than four games. So um, that, that's definitely why some of those games where he may have seen time had he not had the option of red shirting, um, you know, you, you may have seen a Mason Garcia package um, to, to make use of his legs and running ability. But, um, yeah, overall, this program – you know, if you can answer a question or two successfully, primarily, largely uh, on the offensive side, but then also um, there's some unknowns on on defense. But uh, really, feel like the talent that this staff has assembled is um, the best that has been in this program in years. And Coach Houston and the staff has said it as much. They they've really said more than I thought they might, given that the the players haven't necessarily proven themselves and some just in general, and then some specifically at East Carolina, a guy like Gerald Green that's a proven commodity from Georgia Southern, excuse me, and then um, and some of the others. But um, I really think that we're positioned nicely to to stack, you know, some eight, nine, ten win seasons or hopefully more and contend for conference titles and maybe get back into a New Year's bowl game and um, – that's the one good thing. Hopefully, with all this conference realignment that's taking place, hopefully that 12-team playoff will happen the way the way um, it's been said that it would, you know, happen, uh, where we can win our conference and we have an excellent shot of being a, a part of that 12-team playoff. Can could you imagine a a 12-team playoff and um, and the Pirates, you know, being a, an 11 or 12 seed, what have you, going to play between the hedges or Bama or, or whoever? Well, I can because we've played in those venues before, but it would be exactly nice, it would be nice to play there when, when you had, like you said, a tournament type, you know, a, a atmosphere and you had a chance, you know, when it, you had a chance to play for something. Right. And, and, that, and that's what I'm, that's what I meant because, like you mentioned, I, I attended uh, that 1990 game at Georgia, unable to go to the Bama game in 98 because of my football. But, uh, yeah, definitely had the opportunity, very fortunate to, to travel to many games, both home and away with my dad, uh, as you did. And that's something that um, you can't put a price tag on and look forward to making another road trip with my parents this weekend up to the big house. Well, I'll, I'll close with this. I know I've been long winded, but uh, I know you and Gary are going up to Ann Arbor, maybe fine. I don't know if fine is going or not, but cherish, cherish these trips, Bubba, because I, I, I lost my dad in 01, but I am so glad that he was a part of, of my football life. My mom and dad went with Vicky and I to so many home games. And then dad went with me on a lot of the road trips and uh, I've got wonderful memories of our time together. So enjoy the trip to Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor with, uh, with your dad. Now, John, uh, as we wrap this up, the final thing I have is just 
what would your message be for Pirate Nation? In Pirate Club numbers dipped significantly, as well as season ticket numbers dipped significantly um, for a several year stretch there with not much on on the field success. But that has changed under Coach Houston. We have better leadership now with John Gilbert and his staff. And uh, you know, Pirate Club numbers are you know about 62, 6300 at least now. Still, still well below where they once were, but it, definitely on the way back. And then season ticket sales, 16,000, trending in the right direction. So, whether it's somebody that's done one or both of those things before, or someone who loves the Pirates but uh, hasn't joined the Pirate Club, hasn't bought season tickets, what would your message be? Well, you know, I would say if, if you love East Carolina, and if you're listening to this podcast, then that means you do. Um, Number one, join the Pirate Club if you're not a member. And I will say that consecutive years of membership is extremely meaningful. Whatever you do, don't stop. You know, donate something, whatever you can afford every single year. Buy season tickets if you can. Um, you you got to support the program. you got to support it financially. Uh, I've, I think I have donated to every uh, capital uh, campaign that we've ever had, you know, as much as I can. Um, and if you can't do that, at least buy season tickets to whatever sport you could, you can possibly, uh, uh, buy you tickets to, but, you know, stay positive and support the team, stay positive and, and support East Carolina. You know, our, our baseball program is great. Basketball is certainly improving under, uh, coach Mike Schwartz. Uh, and, and football is is respectable again. And I think it's going to be a really good year this year. But um, join the Pirate Club and give what you can. And if you can't buy season tickets, come to whatever games you can come to. If you can't go to a bowl game, buy some tickets and donate those tickets. So, you know, from, from the financial standpoint, you know, just give what you can. But, but stay positive and support the Pirates. Well said, John, and on, on that note, uh, we'll wrap up this edition of A Pirate's Life for me. I really appreciate you spending nearly an hour and a half with us, but uh, you know, we look forward to, to having you back on the sports objective at some point uh, to talk Pirate football this season, because you're certainly a wealth of knowledge. I know you follow it very closely, as do we, uh, so uh, we'll have you on A Pirate Football Playback on a Sunday night or something like that. I look forward to it, and you guys have safe travels to Ann Arbor, and go Pirates. Pirate Nation, that is John McMillan. Uh, again, you're watching and listening to A Pirate's Life for me here on the Sports Objective. Like and follow us on X at the, the Sports OBJ on uh, Facebook, TikTok, you name it. You can find us on social media. Like and, like and follow us on all those platforms. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll talk to you real soon here on A Pirate's Life for Me on the Sports Objective. Take care, and as always, go Pirates. The Sports Objective, the podcast for Pirates.